The, the, the research program, which is called LEGOV, Legitimacy and Global Governance, started out from the observation that the legitimacy of, of global governance institutions like international organizations or international public-private partnerships or international private arrangements seems to be increasingly contested in various ways. And we were interested in finding out just the extent to which international organizations are perceived to be legitimate. Um, we were also interested in the processes of legitimation and delegitimation that affect how people perceive of these institutions. And then, in the end, we're also interested in the question of, of the consequences of legitimacy for, for uh, the operation of these international organizations. Now, when we started out, I mean, we thought this was topical, but it's become increasingly topical as we've, as we've researched this over the past four years, and to, to a degree that uh, we're not all of us feel comfortable with the topic necessarily. So when you say the legitimacy of, of global governance institutions, of international organizations, you're looking at it from the perspective of states and state governments, or primarily from citizens, or is it both? So we are um, agnostic as to the, uh, the, what we call audiences of, of, uh, of uh, the legitimacy claims that are issued by international organizations and other types of global governance institutions. Traditionally, uh, research in political science has been very centered on states as the primary audience of the legitimacy of, of international organizations, but we seek to you know, move from states to a, a much more uh, varied conception of these audiences, which also include uh, you know, civil society organizations, uh, uh, business organizations, other types of non-state actors, but also citizens at large. But could you summarize what some of the kind of key uh, motivating factors are in legitimation and de delegitimation as the product project has progressed? Or are there any key things that you could point to to say, if, if I had to talk about anything, I talk about these particular factors which seem to be instrumental or key in thinking about legitimacy in, in the global context? So we um, divide the different factors that drive legitimacy beliefs by way of different levels. And, and one level is the individual level, the extent to which people are personally, economically affected uh, by, by the, the, the policies of, of uh, international organizations. Um, things like uh, their level of cosmopolitan uh, sense or belonging or orientation, but also the extent to which they use different types of cognitive shortcuts like heuristics. So the individual level is an important one in terms of exp explaining people's legitimacy beliefs, and we vary on, on those different parameters. But then there's also the institutional level, how international organizations are organized in terms of their purpose, their social purpose, the, the aims of the, of the policies. Um, the procedures that they use to adopt these policies, uh, sometimes referred to as input legitimacy, mm -hmm. and the types of, of, of consequences that they generate, um, um, it, often referred to as their output legitimacy. So that's at this institutional level. Uh, but then there might also be a set of, shall we say, social, structural, or societal sets of factors that are at a third level which uh, are essentially about the extent to which there are you know, cultural and power hegemonies out there, mm -hmm. there's social stratification, these larger types of processes uh, in which both citizens or individuals and, and, uh, and international organizations are embedded. Mm -hmm. And then finally, to make this complicated, there's a fourth level, which we might call process factors, which are about uh, the extent to which elite communication or legitimation, delegitimation as such, affects the legitimacy beliefs of people. And I think it's safe to say that we have good indications, empirical indications, that this individual level, it matters significantly. These institutional factors and differences matter significantly. It's more difficult to get that these larger social structural uh, ones, but we also have good empirical evidence that, that elite communication affects how people think about international organizations. What, what, what's coming through, I think, in your research you're saying then is that there isn't any kind of key factors or magic formula that we can say, well, you know, these are the main drivers behind legitimation or delegitimation processes in, in respect of global governance organizations. It depends very much on the context. So what we're saying is that there are multiple factors that affect people's legitimacy beliefs vis-a-vis -vis global governance institutions. And some of those are located at the individual level. Some of those have to do with the institutional features of global governance institutions. And, and some of those have to do with, with communicative processes in society, how elites 
uh, advocate in favor or against global governance institutions. And we have solid evidence for all of those, but there's not one explanation that comes out of this. Uh, in fact, one of the challenges for us is how to reconcile these different types of explanations into one account. So one question that uh, a theme, in, in some ways a, a driving theme behind this project, but also that, that's come, come up in, in all of our talks is the idea of the current state of affairs that you talked about um, earlier on and this idea of populism gripping hitherto maybe stable societies, hitherto countries that were very supportive of what we would call an international rules-based order that would be supportive of international organizations, global governance organizations. Um, what, are, what are your views on that in terms of are we seeing, is this a qualitative difference in the, what's often called a crisis of legitimacy in international law, international organizations? Is it uh, part of something that's been going on for a while? I mean, the idea of crisis in international legitimacy is not new. But I'm wondering, from, from your perspective and from the research you've undertaken, do you see that this kind of populism in, for example, sitting in the UK in Brexit, or uh, what the US president has talked about in terms of his intentions for, for the international organizations of which the US was traditionally supportive. Um, is this something new, do you think? Is this something that has something changed here? Or is this par for the course? This is something that's been going on for a while and it's just be, got more media attention. That's a very good question. Um, I think you're absolutely correct that these are you know, momentous events, these are big events. We're talking about Trump and the attitude of the United States to international institutions. We're talking about Brexit. We're talking about government leaders in countries like, like Brazil, India, the Philippines and elsewhere that um, mobilize on the basis of an anti-globalist type of populism. Um, that said, when we go to the data and the time series that we have access to, we see much more resilience than what the attention to these populist leaders' agendas would lead us to believe. Um, we find that um, you know, both, we find that citizens' um, you know, level of confidence in international institutions is pretty much constant uh, over time. We find that you know, uh, with regard to confidence in, in the EU, for instance, it's, it's higher in most parts of Europe. I mean, it's pretty much at an, at an all-time high in the European Union at the moment, partly as a reaction to Brexit. Um, we find that confidence in the, in, the, uh, in the United Nations is also pretty high. Uh, we have just uh, polled um, 860 political and societal leaders in six countries at the global level in a large elite survey uh, uh, in the LEGO program. And it turns out that their average level of, of confidence in these institutions also is pretty high across these countries with slightly lower levels in South Africa and Russia, but still at a fairly high level. And there are other indications out there that don't support the impression that, that things are going, um, you know, that there's some kind of structural decline or, or um, uh, unidirectional type of decline in the legitimacy of global governance institutions. If you look at patterns with regard to street protests, if you look at discursive uh, contestation in the media and so on, we simply do not see those indications yet. Um, that could be because we are not picking up where the change is happening. Or it could be that we are behind the curve, that our time zeros have not yet picked up the, the, these trends, these changes. But for the time being, I'm hesitant to, to conclude that we're actually experiencing that broad-based, deep uh, crisis of legitimacy that so many are talking about. Mm -hmm. And if it were the case that we see a broader popular disaffection with organizations beyond the state with a role in policy making, lawmaking and so on. In a lot of the literature, particularly in, in, in law, but, but also I've, I've seen in political science and IR, the idea of democracy keeps coming up, right? That, you know, this is the solution. Ultimately, it has to be more responsive. It has to be more participative. A lot of the sloganeering of the populist movements put democracy front and center of their critiques. Um, do you see this as, as, as something that could be implemented going forward? I mean, in some sense, we have experienced the increasing democratization of the international level in many respects. So in more participatory, participatory structures, again, the European Union obviously is an obvious example of this with the growth of the European Parliament and so on. But what are your views on the, prospect, the, the prospects of democratizing, increased democratization of international governance? 
So let me first say that if we go to the empirical studies that we have conducted over the past couple of years, there is, there is good evidence to suggest that uh, the democratic nature of global governance institutions or the, the extent to which they work by way of democratic procedures has an effect on people's legitimacy perceptions. Mm. We have shown this in survey experiments where we vary the procedures of international organizations such that respondents sometimes get confronted with a democratic IO and sometimes with a less democratic IO and they consistently prefer the more democratic one. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also asked questions to uh, elites in our recent Leg of Elite survey about what features of international organizations that they consider most important when they regard an, an organization as legitimate. Mm. And with regard to the procedures, uh, then democracy is number one. And with regard to the, the output, if you want, then effectiveness is, is number one. So the fact that both citizens and elites care about democracy uh, in the context of global governance is, is, I think, an empirical fact based on, on the type of studies that we have uh, conducted. Now, the question of going forward, that's, that's a different one. And you're absolutely right that we've had a, a debate over two decades about the potential democratic deficit of, of regional and global governance institutions and whether something can be done about it. And, and a lot has been done about it, or, or fairly much has been done about it in various ways. Expanding participation, increasing transparency, trying to strengthen accountability, and so on. Um, Again, and the empirical answer to where more can be done is to observe that we have reached something of a plateau in terms of, of, of uh, these democratizing efforts. If we look at the involvement of civil society organizations in, in global governance or the extent to which international organizations are open to civil society, or if we look to, at the extent to which international, uh, international organizations establish parliamentary institutions like the European Parliament or the uh, OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and, and so on, we find that those efforts plateaued around 2010 mm -hmm. and that we're not seeing the same kind of increase. That might be because we're reaching some kind of level of saturation because there had been a very rapid increase from 1990 and onwards, but it might also be that we're encountering more resistance on the part of, of some states, especially with regard to a further democratization of global governance. Professor Talberg, thank you very much for speaking to us today. You're welcome.